Today's gonna be a good day. I can feel it because today this guy is gonna meet his new best friend this guy, the gearbox that has eagerly been waiting in my garage for quite some time. Uh, we're gonna dig through this guy and uh, more specifically we're gonna install the limited slip differential on this guy so that it can go on to that guy. Let's have a look at that. What is this then? This is the G50, the, the gearbox that most Porsche 964s have. This is a 5-speed, simply because I couldn't get a hold of a 6-speed. They're very, very, very difficult to find, and I couldn't afford a sequential gearbox, which would be even cooler, right? Uh, so, uh, it's a G50 that I bought off of a friend. Uh, this car used to be a C4, so it used to have this G64 gearbox, which is a super cool engineering beast however it's very heavy and it's not really what where i'm trying to go with with the build of this car so we're going to start off with putting this in my engine mount and from there on we're going to take apart what we need to take apart so that we can get on to the engine the way that i'm planning to do this is just simply put one of these engine stand mounts i'm going to put it on top of the gearbox on this side So let's see how this works with having this one in here. I'm going to take that off as well. Here we go. Spline shaft, everything looks perfect, great. There we go, it released. Okay, open sesame. Okay, so with the old differential exposed, we can lift it up and it is quite heavy. Okay, let's see what we got having this guy down on the table. We have, uh, of course, the cover we took away. It's awfully dirty right now. There's a seal here, of course, that should go out and be changed. Then I see some other goodies here, and that is this speed sensor. I'm going to get rid of this one. I see that there's a ring on it with a number of small little mini magnets and that is because the speed sensor here on this guy that one counts the the passings here so it gets the, the speed sensor from that and on the old 964s it had that speed setting there or speed sensor there on the gearbox on the newer ones it took it from the ABS instead which is what you do on all modern cars since you're counting on for the ABS anyway. Uh, so I'm going to remove this. It also means I can ditch this ring. So let's get that ring out of the way straight away. And the reason I, I need to take it apart is I need to get to the bevel gear. Uh, and this bevel gear is matched with the pinion gear in the, the gearbox. So those need to, to follow each other. Okay, and with that, we are down here, and now it's this guy we want to reuse, right? Uh, because that guy needs to go on the new diff. Okay, here we go. This is the method that I'm applying. I'm just going to bend it away like this. Okay, here goes. Bonk. Good plastic under it. You might ask yourself, why are we even talking about a differential? What is the point? Well, the point is that you need a differential in most cars for the car to behave in a proper way. However, you want to manage this behavior in a good way. So let's first have a look at an open diff. So this is the one that you have in standard in your 964C2. Uh, you have it in every other car as well. It's known as an open diff. So an open diff is just that. Look at this. You have an open diff there, right? And the way it works is that if you turn one RPM up here, 
the center will turn with half an RPM and the bottom will stand still. And this is very relevant that you have your two wheels like this, right? One wheel and the other wheel. And you're going into a bend, right? You're going into a bend here. Then this wheel needs to turn a little bit less than this wheel, right? Because you're going like this. So imagine if this would be rigid. Right? Now you would be skidding through the corner because you would force the wheels to have the same RPM. And that's what you have on a go-kart, right? A go-kart has exactly the same wheels. And what you do when you're driving go-kart is you're trying to you know, lean outwards in the corner to, to lift the inner wheel so it can spin. Uh, why, why, is, why is this then relevant when you go to a race car to do something different? Well, here you have a different issue. You have a lot of power, right? Look at this guy. It's going to be really, really powerful and really good. So you get into a corner and now all of a sudden the car is leaning one direction. So you're going to get a lot more friction, a lot more grip on this wheel. And at the same time, you're trying to accelerate out of the corner. And as you do that, your inner wheel slips up and now all of your power escapes through your inner wheel. And, and you will notice this if, if you've been in this track situation and you have some good power in your car, you're going in through a corner, you're trying to accelerate on the way out and you hear zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
this this pin what happens with this pin is that when the outer casing is driving meaning you're accelerating and it's the engine that is driving then this this pin will actually move up so that it pushes the two halves apart and when it pushes the two halves apart that will lock up the differential even more than the pretension you get from this washer right uh, likewise when you're going in the other direction when you're actually coming in doing an engine brake then the wheels will drive this pin to go in the other direction and that will lock up the differential so that the car stabilizes during braking you don't want to have one wheel that is not turning and another one that is locking up it will actually keep them moving as you're braking uh, so there is a few things with this that it takes a while to get your mind around uh, I'm in no way any expert with this but what I do understand is that the uh, ramp angles as they're called with with how this pin looks that affects how aggressive the, the diff is and how quick it locks up and the other thing that affects is how hard the pretension on this this LSD is and that's what we're going to do now we are going to test the pretension on this pretension pretension how do we test pretension uh, got the LSD put back together uh, we have the two drive flanges which have splines what I'm going to do is one of them I'm going to secure in a vise and I, I designed a little tool like this and the concept is that it will grab onto these two nuts they are clamped securely down on this and then this will then fit in the vise uh, this is just 3d printed stuff I'll put these on my web page in the web shop there so that if anyone needs these to do an LSD test on your own then you can get them there so let's see got this guy in there <clears throat> okay and we clamp this down it sits pretty good there then we have this guy got one of these torque meters that has scale there so as you have overcome the, the static friction. You can read this one and see what it is. And this one says that this diff is right now at about 100 Newton meters, which is uh, a lot more than uh, what I, I've heard that it should be. So I'm a little bit worried about that. Uh, and the reason why I'm worried about that is that, of course, if, if your diff is, is too hard, then the car will severely understeer. You're coming into a corner and, and you're trying to steer. and The wheels, they, they don't want to release from each other. So it's going to be very difficult to steer and you're going to have to drive very aggressively, which is cool and all, but maybe not what I'm going to do the first lap around the, the course with this car. Reading up a little bit more, getting good input from all the great Porsche community out there. Uh, I think I'm going to stay at 100. It's not a big deal if I do need to adjust this in the future. Put the car on the lift, put it up, take the diff out with the gearbox still in the car. So it's, it's not really a big deal. Um, I wanted to just show you how you could adjust the preload in the diff. Uh, one natural way is to increase the thickness of the, the seal plates if you do that and buy thicker plates because they are available in different thicknesses. That's if you want it to be stiffer. The, uh, the other way is of course put a distance washer in there so you just put more things into the, to the thing. Uh, that's been known to work. Uh, if you wanted to make it uh, looser, then one way is to, of course, decrease the thickness and buy thinner spacers or wait for it to, to wear out a bit. Uh, there is another way and that is to shift the order of the brake discs and the steel plates. In my case, I'm going to run with it like this and it's going to be fantastic. Now for the bearing assembly, where it's important that the thing not only sits in the middle so that you have the right gear lash and the, the right... Uh, interface with the uh, with the pinion and the, the bull wheel there uh, it also needs to have the right pretension in between the the two angular bearings that sits there and this is set with distance washers like this so this one is two millimeters there it initially sat with two millimeters plus another 1.7 millimeters in this side 
And on the other side, it's sat with 2.6, I think. That was the other diff. This is a new diff, so this is not exactly the same, right? The concept is that it's supposed to sit with an interference fit of 0.4 millimeters, as far as the, the workshop manual has led me to believe. Um, which I am assuming is going to be very similar to what it was on the other diff. But I'm going to do this. I'm going to put the bearing on here with only the 2 millimeter spacer to start with. Uh, after I have that one in there, uh, I'm going to put the whole thing into the gearbox, measure. And then when I see that uh, I, I have a certain gap there, then that gap will help me to calculate how much the last washer should be. And then I will lift the bearing, put the washer in there and put the bearing back. So let's start with putting the bearing in here at first. This might be just my, my favorite, uh, favorite tool in the whole garage. There are a few things in life that are best done in pairs. One of them is to change both races of a taper bearing. Um, so we've changed the inner races now. They're securely fastened on the diff. That's great. Now we're going to have a look at the um, uh, outer races. So the outer race sits really jammed in there. Uh, and I'm going to try an old farmer's trick here with just putting a, a little uh, weld seam on the inside of the race there because I don't have a tool that really gets in under this bearing. I mean, what can go wrong? And the great thing about this is that you will really not damage anything when you do this because you, you put that seam around the inside of the bearing and when that kind of attaches to the, uh, the outer race it shrinks when it cools and then the bearing all of a sudden is smaller and then yeah then you can get it out and this one will pop out any second so that was easy enough hopefully not too many people hated me for the method uh, now the outer race needs to go into the casing and it's uh, for obvious reasons very difficult to take the gearbox and put it in the press so um, there's another way of doing this and it's essentially based on that you put a big washer behind the bearing like this or behind the outer race in this case like this uh, you put that in there and then from the other side you hold it with something that is much bigger than the hole and then you put a big bolt through it and you tighten this bolt and it kind of you know just uh, closes the gap on this guy uh, I'm gonna put the diff in Note that I don't have the, the ring gear on the, uh, the diff and that is for a very special reason and that is that I don't want to get the pinion and ring gear interference to have anything to do with this. And we're going to put the cover on there and this needs to be torqued down properly so that it gives the, the right kind of... yeah right kind of push towards the bearing <clears throat> the trick now is to determine how much clearance we have because we did not put all the the distance washers in there the spacers in there that we had originally uh, and the reason for that was we want to now measure the gap we have this way so when i when i push here it actually moves uh, so that gap plus 0.4 millimeters that is the spacer that we should be putting in there so just making use of two of the the holes that we have there anyway right uh, i've then made a little beam that just goes across as i turn this as i push this guy now 0.42, 0 0.45. Okay, I got a 2.6 millimeter here that I could swap for the two, and then I have a 0 0.25 here. So these together is 2.85. So this, this should do the trick. So out with this, off with the bearing, in with that. This is of course super delicate because you, you, you want to really make sure when you push this brand new bearing off of this thing that you don't touch the, the roller carrier or the roller cage with this. Uh, so there is a little groove on each side. Should 
fit perfectly. Yep, we are in good shape. Yes. We are in perfect shape. Great. Two millimeter washer off. And now we insert back 2.85 exactly. Like any sane mechanic, I want to make a check on this to see that this is really the way it's supposed to be. I ended up redoing this three times because I put it back in, I measured, there was still clearance, took it apart, measured the shims again, ba 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 ba. Now I'm there and for the record I have 2.6 millimeter on one side and 3.4 millimeters on the other side. Now comes the tricky piece. Now the bevel gear needs to go in there and uh, we're gonna have to measure if that one is in the right spot. So I might have to redo everything again. Let's see. And we take the, the bevel gear, the one that we took apart before and we put it back in there. This one has some good markings here that says what the backlash and all of the things should be. So that's something good to take note of. You strap the gear to it and then we're going to tight, tighten it. Tighten this guy up, 150 newton meters. Here comes the next little delicate thing, and that is that now that the, the whole thing is in here, we need to measure this backlash, because this backlash is an indication of how the gears, how they sit in relation to each other. I'm in this assuming that the pinion is in the right place, and that we're only adjusting this, because the other way is to adjust the pinion. But uh, I'm assuming that that is in the right place. So let's get the washer on here. Now getting into what I hope will be the last step of this, or at least the last exploratory step of this, and that is to set the backlash of the gear. We have set the pretension of the, uh, the two um, taper bearings so that we have the right pretension of them. Now it's the backlash. And the backlash is related to, to how the gears, since this is a bevel gear, how close to each other they are and where they're positioned. There's a whole theory around this. Uh, I'm in this assuming that the pinion is set in the correct place and that the matching bevel gear, the matching crown wheel or ring gear, it's got all kinds of names, this, this component. Uh, I'm assuming that that's the only thing we need to adjust. So we need to adjust where it sits in the gearbox. And uh, to do that, we're measuring backlash. So that's the, the distance between the, the gears as, as they go in between each other. Uh, there's a lot of different special tools for this. I again resorted to, to just what I know how to do, and that is I created a, a dial yes. that goes in here. And as you put this one in here, you feel a lot of clearance, and that is because the, the whole thing kind of moves throughout the, the diff train and everything, and, and there's a little trick to lock this up and it is to put just an electric wire there in the bottom. You see that? Uh, I just put an electric wire there. This is something I, f I found online just out of a coincidence. When I have this one with a wire there, it, it jams in between it. And now as I move this one, the differential and the gear will move immediately. There will be no rattle in between it. So I have this one, then need something to fit a dial gauge onto this. So I designed a little thing for that as well. Here this one is. So just print it out of PET G. Again, all of this in my web shop if you would like to have it. Okay, there we go. Put this one away for a second. Put the dial in there. Now we put this one somewhere, maybe there, okay, good. Okay, so we got this one as far as we have this together. Good. We have a system here that is rigid all the way, 
But what we don't have, which is a big problem here, is that as soon as I move here, I actually move the pinion. So we need to do one small little thing more. And that is to lock up this baby over here. So another little thing here. Uh, it holds the nut on this side. It holds the nut on this side. It interlocks this shaft with this shaft. And really the purpose is to lock this one and you're just using this as a holder. So on with this one. Okay, good, interlocked. And then you just take out the clearance from the nuts by doing that. So now this whole thing is locked up. I used the wire here to lock the, the flange towards the diff and I've locked this shaft so it doesn't turn. So all the movement I have here is actually the gear lash. So let's see what it is. Okay, so I hold it in one direction. I zero it. 16. Zero. With great consistency, we have a gear lash here of 15, 16 hundreds. That's great. And we will be changing it over to a different angle just to check for consistency. Okay, 90 degrees. And guess how happy I am to see that actually I was within tolerance on this on the first go when I was shimming up the, the diff to get the right preload on on this one uh, I had to do it three times because I don't know what I made for mistakes there but it, it was it was wrong anyway now I had 016 then I had 013, 013 and 016 and that's uh, within tolerance the, the tolerance is that around the lap the deviation cannot be more than 0 0.05 and I'm below that so that's good uh, there is a backlash number set on the ring gear itself you can read it out there it says 0 016 in mine and you can't go above that you can go below by 500s but you can't go above that so I'm good and the the Tools worked out really well. Uh, I've made a supply run to get all the seals and all of that in. Uh, this took probably 10 times as long time as I thought it would, and that's brilliant. Uh, because either I'm slow or I'm a time optimist, and maybe it's both of them. Uh, nevertheless, this is set. This is going to work fine. I'm going to get the parts in, clean this up, and for the next get-go, I'm going to get the gearbox onto the engine, which I thought was going to happen today. Uh, but you know what? Thank you very much for watching. Give me any feedback you might have on this, because this, this is sort of a complicated piece of, of the whole thing, and it's the first time I'm doing it. Thank you for watching. See you next time.